Welcome back to the third chapter or session of the Real Method series with um, Daniel Rodriguez and Tom Stamberger as at the beginning. So today we're going to talk about the E of the Real Method. The Real Method is R-E-A-L and today the topic is E. During our first session, I introduced the real method as the ritual engagement with the artificial artifacts that humans create in the pursuit of the liminal, in the pursuit of transformation. The second session, I introduced a concept of ritual as different from routines that we always follow, like going to the bathroom, brushing our teeth, preparing coffee, because they have a a, a different meaning. They have a symbolism to it. They have been practiced since we know about humanity for by all societies, and they bring us together to try to grasp something that is not so obvious, and that we have relegated them in our current culture to practices in their religions. Like if you are a Christian, you your Children go through baptism and confirmation, and then you have the communion, and, and we celebrate weddings. And we do have rituals like Christmas and Thanksgiving and New Year's um, Eve parties, etc. But ritual is not as such a big component of our lives like it has been traditionally, because we have separated ourselves from the continuous practice of religion, which is the activity that. Uh, really has become um, expert in rituals. And the inv invitation of the ritual method, of the real method, is that we use rituals in the pursuit of wisdom, in the cultivation of wisdom. And we illustrated that with our um, mindful conversation ritual uh, last time we recorded. Today, I'm going to introduce engagement and the four E's that determine a new understanding of the mind and therefore a new understanding of what is meant when we engage with artifacts, with the things that we create in culture. Feel free to uh, interrupt and ask me any questions. And before I start introducing engagement, could you uh, share with me if you have any questions about what we said before? What does it mean, ritual engagement with artifacts in the pursuit of the liminal? What do I mean by engagement, the topic of today? Okay, engagement gives you the idea that you take an object and you engage with the object. That you see a person and you engage with a person. Okay? An engagement in the new emerging science of the mind that is called embodied, embodied mind, has also another meaning that I hope to unveil today. To conclude, and you have to tell me if I was good in my explanation, to propose that these tools, these artifacts that humans have created and that we inherit throughout the generations as culture can be said to be who we are. In other words, I'm going to propose today that tools are us. That when I talk to about engagement, I am saying that that engagement with the tools that we inherit from culture make us who we are. Okay. So why is this new interpretation of what the mind is and what engagement is? This new way of seeing this has become more and more important in the study of the mind in the last 20 years, but has some um, pioneering uh, researchers uh, before that. And the idea is that <clears throat> first, for a, around 40 years, the study of the mind concentrated in thinking that our minds were like computers with an input and an output, and something happened in the middle. And that has been demonstrated that it's not good. So many um, attempts to build uh, intelligent robots failed because of this computational model of the mind. 
So the new model of the mind is organic, biological, and it says that the mind is not the brain. The mind is embodied. So the paradigm is called embodied cognition. Cognition, again, means all the mental processes like learning, memory, perception, emotion, re, um, uh, problem solving, judgment, decision making, etc. That the brain is not everything. That how the bodily understands and participates with the environment is what makes the mind. When we accept that the mind is embodied, that brain, body, and the physical environment and the social environment constitute the mind, what we call embodied cognition, there are a few themes that emerge, a few possibilities. One of these possibilities is based on the questions, where does the mind end? If now we are saying it doesn't end in the brain, and we are saying that it includes the, the body and that it includes the physical environment and the social environment. So where does the mind end? So to researchers uh, in 1998, 1990, 1999, 1998, uh, Andy Clark and David Chalmers, they wrote a, a, an essay called The Extended Mind, basically saying, that the boundaries of the mind are determined by the actions that we can take into the world. And they gave this example, the blind man that is walking in the street with a cane, where does his mind end? He's touching the, the sidewalk, otherwise he couldn't walk. So he has made the cane an extension of his body, an extension of his perceptual system. When somebody is the captain of a naval ship that has 50 people controlling everything, where does the mind of the captain end if he's controlling everything? So basically, he has become distributed. His mind is not only his. It's his mind, all the instruments, the artifacts of the, of the, of the ship, plus the people working to control it. So that idea that the mass is extended has gained more and more traction. And Andy Clark, the proponent of the extended mind model, then next wrote a book called Supersizing the Mind. You know, making the mind like supersizing the, the hamburger, giving more and more examples on how, because we collaborate, we have this ability as humans, to create these networks of people doing things uh, like the internet, more and more we're able to do more things because we extend ourselves beyond the individual organism, the individual persona. Any comments about this concept? Uh, for me, the concept, uh, I mean, it, it, it does make sense when with the example that you gave about the captain in that it's a distributed mind, um, including not just the physical elements, gauges, instruments, so forth, but also the people. And you you spoke earlier about tools are us. And the thought that came to mind as you were kind of uh, explaining right now is if I am, let's say, going into a meeting and through practice, whatever, I have internalized the tools that get presented in the wisdom project um, um, or techniques, whatever you want to call it. I've, I've internalized them. I just know when the situation is in front of me, I automatically just use one of those tools. And I use one of those tools with the purpose of achieving an outcome or an experience. So for example, uh, when we have a, a meeting, I don't go around saying, okay, now I'm using mindful conversation. I just do it. I paraphrase, I listen, I paraphrase, and I ask more in-depth question to create a much richer experience amongst the group of people that I'm meeting with. So um, 
you know, when when you say tools are us, yeah, I am the tool. When with that experience that that that, that we're generating, um, and this is kind of the thought that comes to mind when you talk about tools are us, and internalizing the tool. And so, where where does my mind end? It doesn't end with me. It ends with everybody that's participating at that moment in time. And even to kind of further that that thought a little bit, um, in like in a sales organization, when when you look at the top producers, those those experts in sales, uh, they they know all kinds of techniques and tools and ways of doing things, and they're not consciously thinking, oh, now I'm going to do this, now I'm going to do that. They just basically act upon whatever the experience that is in front of them. They know automatically without even thinking what to do in order to enrich that experience. And as I said earlier, obtaining an outcome um, um, or once again, an experience that they want to generate, you know, get the information qualifying a customer. Is that more or less uh, in, in, in the right? That's the idea. The next book he wrote, Andy Clark, he's a philosopher from England. The next book was called Mindware. Basically, like a, that, the, what's the name of what you have? Headphones. The headphones that you have are mindware because they are allowing you to function in this environment without interruptions from the external environment. But again, I have negative reactions against that concept that we have this mindware that we incorporate in our daily lives because people don't like to think of themselves, of themselves as Andy Clark wrote in another book, we are naturally born cyborgs. Saying that, you know, the cyborg is the, the, the organism that has technology implanted on him or her. And he says, yes, we are that. Why? Because since we are babies, our mommies say thanks, say thanks. Please, Daniel, please, Thomas, please, Iris, please say thanks. And then there is one day, Thomas, as you were saying, we start saying thank you, thank you, thank you, without remembering that somebody took the pain of repeating it th thousands of times to make us cyborg in the sense that the giving thanks is a sentence is a call to order, a way of inviting you to participate in society that we have, as Thomas said, incorporated or internalized in who we are. Daniel, you have any comments to this? Yeah, I just have a clarification question. Um, the idea of tools being us makes sense to me. Um, but because, you know, we, we are only able to interact in our environment when we understand it. So, so like our, our whole paradigm is is built off these tools. That that concept I understand. My only distinction, or my only, I suppose, uh, I just have a curiosity of in the in the example of the captain ship and the embodied mind. The mind includes all the sailors because they're being they're being understood as tools, right? He, he, the, the the embodied mind doesn't encapsulate their minds as well. Just encapsulates them as an idea because they know what function or the mind knows what function these specific people are going to perform, right? It's not that it, the, the embodied mind is also this, or because you said the mind expands to all of these people as well. So you're not saying the mind expands to their minds. Or, I, I just want to clarify that. Well, uh, I would say, even though, as I said, it's a new paradigm, 20 years is kind of new. Not everybody's in agreement, even though they think that the mind is embodied. But the extended mind is also have been also called distributed. They, okay. You can see the, the novel ship as a mind that has a purpose, an intentionality to get from port A to port B, from California, from San Diego to San Francisco, for instance. And all the people that work there has particular functions. Right. See? So they, this gives an enormous power to what you can do to change families and organizations and groups because the things that you learned about a particular individual mind, you can also apply to two people, three people, four people, which is what I do in my work as a management consultant. So uh, the idea of the extended mind applies to the blind man work, walking with a cane by himself on the street and also to the whole distributed 
team of sailors in that naval ship of my example. I think you know to to kind of expand a little bit and 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 address Danny's question. It's not that the other sailors are are an instruments, a tool. I mean, they're not a robot or not a mechanical thing that just does things. I mean, they are in charge. They have a responsibility to man a part of the ship. But it's in their mind where they also need to make decisions based on whatever the circumstances are in front of them. So the captain does not need to know the nitty gritty piece because their sailors are the ones doing that so his 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 mind is now extended incorporating also the mind of you know his subordinates the uh the, the other sailors in order to attain that goal of taking the ship from point a to point b does that kind of yeah. have a little bit <laughs> no no uh, yeah i i get that it was just i think now my question was i'm seeing as more of just a semantical question because when you said the captain's mind includes all of the other people I was like, I just that didn't really click with me. How can how can one mind also include all these oh, other minds? Okay, okay. But when you said it as a distribution system, that that clears it up a lot. Yeah, it yeah. I, perhaps yes, I misspoke because we are so uh, in trapped by the param paradigm of the mind as belonging to one individual. That <laughs> yeah. people talking, yeah. even people talking like me, we just say the captain or. Yeah. Um, you know, a cognitive scientist that is is a researcher on the on the embodied mind framework says the mind and the body, forgetting that he or she just defined the mind as being the body, the brain, mm -hmm. the interaction with the physical world and, and the in the social world. Yeah, we we it's called the Cartesian paradigm that was established 400 years ago that the mind is separated from the body by the the card. And we steal our prisoners from that. And we say, oh, the mind and my in the heart. Or yeah, it's just we need to to I mean just just, just think that there are some phrases out there just come to mind right now when people say, let's put our heads together. Yeah. All right. That's kind of everybody. Or hey, two heads think better than one. I mean, we're already kind of using some of that language where it's not just in one, but it's in whatever the uh the people are that are participating in that experience yeah yeah it is said that that's what makes humans unique the ability for intersubjectivity which is the ability of as thomas said of creating one mind one put our head put our heads together to share a goal and without necessarily talking all the time to be able to deliver that goal by coordinating, collaborating, and cooperating in our efforts. You know, even, even to go a little bit further with that, and, and again, I, I'm just getting these, these images. Um, let's look at a football team or a soccer team. All right. It's a distributed mind. I mean, each player is, is at a different part of the field. They have a different per perception. I mean, at the end of the day, the goal is to score, right? Um, and yes, there are some communication, but they're all thinking and, and, and strategizing based on what's going to happen when suddenly this person passes me the ball. Okay, I need to start saying, okay, what do I do now? And I have to then strategize around me, okay, what are the situations that I'm facing? And not maybe you know, verbally, but I need to be able to communicate with my other player from my team because I'm going to pass the ball over to him. And mind uh, on that field at that moment in time yeah so <clears throat> again you know the the paradigm of the embodied mind then relies on this theme that the mind is extended that andy clark and, and david chalmers presented uh, 24 years ago but it also relies on another thesis which is the mind is embedded I guess you don't do that, but still one of my favorite activities is to go to the library. And I still, you know, I know I can do it on, they have apps on my phone, but I still enjoy going to the library and discover books just by the way the, the librarians organize them. Books that I would never think of 
choosing. And, but if I go and walk, I discover. So <clears throat> the way the library is organized alphabetically and for topics and sections, et cetera, gives my mind a way of being in the world that I wouldn't have if I go to the library, just a bunch of books from history, for children, from sociology. So I am embedded in an environment that allows me to do a effective search. The same goes <coughs> with the GPS. <coughs> a few years back, we were traveling to New York. <coughs> there was an, <coughs> sorry. There was an accident in the main highway, uh, 95, and we had to take different routes. And there was no cell phone service for a while. And we stopped using maps. We didn't have maps in the car. So we got stop, stuck longer than we should have because we didn't have something that used to be on the, <laughs> the smartphone, a natural way of navigating, you know, long distances. Um, that we love doing because we love uh, taking vacations where we drive to different places. So the maps give us the possibility of having the mind extended because we are embedded in that environment. Today is the GPS which does that for us. So do, can you think of when, when we go to the supermarket to buy groceries, we create a list. And then we, we see the list to remind us what we need to buy. Or if we don't make the list just by walking the supermarket in a regular way, we discover the things that we want to buy. So when I have to go to a new supermarket or to a supermarket where I'm not used to go because it's, you know I go to another one, uh, I forget things because I just have to walk the different aisles in a, in, a, in, in a way that is not usual for me. Can you think of examples in your own lives with the embedded mind example applies to you? Well, for me, uh, I mean, embedded means to be part of, part of mm -hmm. a system, part of an experience. And um, I mean, my, my engin engineering mind, uh, an example goes to the pressure sensor in your car that's an embedded system. It's not a computer, it's an embedded system of the car that has a specific function. So in this case, that sensor is embedded inside the tire that communicates with the computer in your car and lets them know, hey, you have a flat tire. Um, so in, in no, that- no, in, the, in the gasoline marker? Correct. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all, all the other elements that, that we have in the car, um, our embedded systems. So that is obviously from from a, from a, from a technological, from an electronic or engineering perspective. But when I'm as a person, if I'm embedded, okay, in into a meeting, embedded into an organization, I become part of that or or, or a tool that will allow that entity, that organization, that group, that meeting, whatever it is to once again achieve an outcome. So in that sense, if I consider myself being that tool that I'm embedded into a group, yes, I will have a certain function to do. And, and that's that's where I see the word of, of embedded. It's for me it's being part of part of something or something. Yeah. Thomas, you are becoming the easiest person to convince that tools are us. <laughs> Because usually I confront a lot of opposition. <laughs> you are already calling yourself a tool. But let's say when we are cooking, it's like I don't calculate the time that the rice is going to be cooking covered because I just walk to a clock that is on top of the oven and I just put 12 minutes. And as soon as the alarm rings, I know I have to turn off the the gas. That's what embedded means. Daniel is going to be cooking paella for the whole family on Sunday. <laughs> and Thomas and I, for, you know, his parents, my mom, the whole family, 
Então, assim, na Yard Battling, what recipe we're going to cook? Because I have one that I bought years ago in Spain when I was pregnant with Al. And Thomas has his own method. So for us to do the paella, which we have been doing forever, and Daniel has been eating it since, since he was born or since he was able to eat paella, um, now has to choose. And Thomas and I want to bring the embeddedness of our paella cooking to his reality to see which one he chooses. So there are plenty of examples. So I would like to see if, Daniel, you can think of something. Um, like yeah, I, I think the one that, and uh, correct me if, if this is wrong, but I, I think, um, you know, in a, in a team video game where me and my friends are trying to complete some objective, um, we are able to make plays off of each other. And I, I think that's, I think that's an example of the distributed mind because we both have a common goal. Uh, you know, to score whatever whatever the goal is, um, and we use our different, uh, you know, whether it's positioning or, um, I mean, it, uh, there's a game I'm speaking specifically about is a game called Rock League. It's basically soccer. So the positioning of both of our players, um, and you know, the, the different variables, we're able to. And this doesn't happen every time, but the moments that we like really peak and like uh, and and surpass our own skill levels are when we think together some play without communicating, you know? And it all just happens and it's beautiful. Like, like that's like, it doesn't happen every game, of course, but when that happens, it's the best feeling in the world. Like it all comes together. So yeah, so that, that would be my favorite example of a distributed mind, I guess. Team plays. Distributed mind that is embedded in such a way that you give each other signals on how to proceed at a particular moment. And when you get to have this type of intersubjectivity, understanding yourself as a subjective individual and the subjectivity of the other, and without words, you can coordinate action. It feels wonderful. And it's, it's, it's basically flow. Oh, yeah. So, all right. So <clears throat> engagement. Ritual engagement with artifacts in the pursuit of the liminal, of a transition. And today the topic is engagement. And we said that what type of engagement? The engagement of the paradigm of the embodied mind. And I introduced the extended mind concept and the embedded mind concept. And now I'm going to introduce the inactive. The, the embodied mind is extended, is embedded, and is inactive. And what do I mean by inactive? Because we said that the mind is the brain and the body and the interactions with the physical world and the social world. Inactive means that it's through that dance, that movement in the world that we develop to be who we are. It's not just thinking, it's not just listening, it's sensory motor, sensing and moving in the world that we acquire, the expertises that we acquire. The baby is shaking, how do you say una maraca? Rattle. A rattle. A rattle. The baby that is shaking a rattle is learning how to embody the maraca, the rattle, to produce the sound that is distracting. The <clears throat> The child that is making the effort of standing and just falling and standing because he or she wants to learn to walk is enacting a procedure to be able then to walk. So the mind is inactive because to develop, it has to take action. And that's the third theme of the embodied mind. It is difficult to separate when it's extended, when it's embedded, or when it's inactive, but that's not necessary to separate. Just to think in terms of our bodily movements has given us an opportunity to expand and transform our mind. And that somehow kind of resonates with me, what I always tell people uh, at work 
is that we control our actions, reactions, and our mindset. And I think the combination of those means the enactment. In, in our case, in the sales organization, well, the phone doesn't dial itself. You need to pick up the phone and dial, uh, or you can spend all day kind of, you know, researching, researching, not getting anything done. So you need to enact it. You need to move it. You need to, act, you know, act on it in order to achieve. One of my favorite examples of, an act, you know, there are many, but the one that I really like is I practice it a lot of enactment is the <clears throat> mindfulness meditation known as the body scan, where you concentrate in experiences the sensations of the body in an organized way, scanning the body from top to bottom, from bottom to top. And then when you have practiced that a lot, that becomes a way of being in the world that where sensations teach you as much as thoughts. Where sometimes you have to stop and think, why do I have this pressure in this side of my neck? Why do I have this sensation in the um, top of my <clears throat> stomach? Why? You see, because you are absolutely in attune to those sensations because you are enacting a practice. And that's what people do when they meditate in a, in a particular tradition for long and long hours. They are acquiring a skill of the inactive mind. When, um, when this pilot that I think his name is Sully. 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 Um, his, his jet lost the turbines. And for 20 years, he has never, never, he, for, he basically perhaps thought he had forgotten how to fly, um, how do you say? Um, a what? sailplane, a glider. Sailplane. A glider. But that knowledge he had acquired when he was a young man came to to his service because operating the jet as a glider, he was able to land on the river and nobody died. So all that sensory motor preparation that he had while being a young pilot, learning to um, pilot gliders came at hand when, he, when his extended mind found itself suddenly not at a jet with three turbines, but at a glider. And he was able to extend his mind and embed himself in the signals that were coming from the air and the balance and land successfully a very, very heavy airplane with almost 200 passengers on the river. Nobody died that day. Mm -hmm. That's the new model of the mind, embodied mind or embodied cognition that is extended, embedded, and enacted. Daniel, any comment about? Um, yeah, I have, let me ask a question to see if I understand it correctly. So I have a good friend who is Indian, um, and oftentimes when, when she's talking to me, she will move her head it, it, like this, you know, right? And I, I think that's com very common in India, but that is an enacted way. I, and the purpose of it, I w would love to know, or, you know, learn the psychology behind just out of curiosity. But my example would be that's the an enacted way of communicating with someone else using the head. Yeah. And we have very close friends, you know, Deepak. Oh, you, your friend Koma. <laughs> Yes. And when we met them so many years ago, you know, you were very little <laughs> when we <laughs> met them. And we used to joke because they have a gesture that sometimes means yes and sometimes means no. Oh, yeah. They are enacting um, something in their culture. That's a wonderful example because after living for so many years in Boston, when I go to South America, when I go to a party, last Sunday, we went to a Venezuelan party with Venezuelan music and Caribbean food. And there was a guy very affectionate that he was like, I'm, I lost the, 
the habit of being touched because here in New England, we maintain, you know, a very, very serious, rigid personal space. And so when we were leaving, I told Thomas, Thomas, do you think that guy was too touchy? And then he said, oh, yes, with me too. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized he is enacting, you know, a way of being in the world that somehow I have lost because I live in New England. Yeah, that's a wonderful example. I mean, Danny, you, you bring that example. Obviously, in our culture, we do, we go, you know, this means yes, this means no. And uh, I had an experience many years back. Um, I was training a group of engineers in India, and I was explaining something when I asked the question, you know, does everybody understand, you know, that they did their, their, their head movement. And since I didn't know, I thought they were saying no. But they were actually acknowledging that they were standing that you know, somebody kind of got, got up and, and they clarified what the gesture kind of, kind of means. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and because we never learned that movement as they do it at the beginning, because they I called them my, my brothers from another mother, because we, you know, basically they are extended family. I was trying to learn it and it's impossible. The same way that when you learn to dance um, Caribbean music, salsa particularly, when you are older, you never have the, the subtle movements that we learned um, growing up. In that Venezuelan party, one of my friends was showing me pictures of her niece, <clears throat> which is like five years old, that lives in, in South America dancing. And so that girl, when she's 15, 20, she will know how to dance in ways that is very difficult for somebody to learn because it has not been enacted in his or her culture uh, when she was growing up. <clears throat> and so why is this important for the real method? Why I want to engage, <clears throat> ritual engagement with artifacts in pursuit of the liminal. Because thinking in terms of the <clears throat> embodied mind, which is embedded, extended, and enacted, give us the possibility of switching tools to a certain point to hack, I don't have a good word for this, to hack our minds. I tried to find a synonymous because hacking is a bad word. It's not a positive activity. But the whole idea of the Wisdom Project is that we have all these tools, <clears throat> some of which were given to us by our culture, some of which we want to incorporate in our routine, like Daniel's uh, morning um, um, exercise routine, for instance, that we want to make ours and that we want to used to enrich our mindware to take us to a place of higher wisdom that is the whole purpose of wisdom by design and to do that <clears throat> we can think then of the tools as something that is going to allow us to hack our minds how by, as Thomas said at the beginning, incorporating them in our daily life. Like Thomas said, he starts doing mindful conversations um, almost automatically. Like Iris starts doing body scan almost automatically. Or sometimes I'm doing the body scan and I don't know it. I just notice that I have strong sensations and then I realize, oh, this is irritating me, or I have this feeling of warmth because something happens to, to go through my, through my, through a corner of my eye. So we can hack. I always use the example of the little orange and green uh, worm that is in the tree outside my window. It's a virtual worm that I can see from my window in the tree outside. And it has a perspective of the world that I cannot have. So I cannot hack my mind to have the same perception of perspective of the world that the worm has. 
but I can hack my mind to try to be a little more like Socrates, a little more like Jesus, a little more of, you know, of the I, same. I think the term, I mean, hack, uh, for me, I like to use better understand. Because obviously it's breaking. It's, it's going into something that you you want to see beyond that, see what what kind of what's behind it. And 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 that's why you know the term hack, yeah, it's very much associated to computers and all those things. But for me it's really kind of better understand. Okay, L let me understand this culture. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go out and say I'm gonna hack this culture. But if I better understand it, I can have a better interaction with the people of a particular group, etc. But wouldn't you say that understanding is very limited? Because I am talking about what you just said, that without thinking, without necessarily understanding, the, the, the example of the captain and the sailors in the naval ship, they never understood themselves before this new paradigm of the embodied mind came to the surface as a distributed or extended mind. But they did it, and we have been doing it, working in collaboration with each other, creating intersubjectivity between each other for millennia, and that's what characterizes human cultures. And we don't necessarily understand that. We just do it. So, <clears throat> because if we stop to try to understand, we get perhaps paralyzed. It's just doing it, in learning from doing like the child that is learning to walk yeah i think we can we can uh, have a very long conversation about what is understanding for you versus me and, and things like that um but yeah oh i, I have an example go, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Daniel. i was also gonna have an example mine's really quick um when i at a certain point in my life you know a short period of time i was i found myself upset a lot of the time uh, you know, not just like irritated. And uh, it was during the same exact period of time. And, you know, maybe uh, I don't want to say a small period of my life. Maybe I was irritated for a while. And I didn't understand why. And then I began to do the body scan with you, Tia. And I realized that a lot of the time I was irritated was just because my stomach hurt. And I've always had digestive issues. But like, I remember many, like several times following the, my meditations, I, and you gave me homework that I had to, you know, notice my body more often. And I made an effort and I would notice that like, as soon as I was getting irritated, like mentally, I was completely in my head and I would notice, oh, my stomach is really bothering me right now. I would like usually to shut it away. But I think that that's one of, one of my favorite examples of, yeah, those tools well, it has been, changing your paradigm. Yeah, it has been proven that judges give harsher, harsher sentences just before lunchtime. Huh. Wow. And just after after lunchtime, they're very lenient. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they should be doing a body scan before condemning somebody to three years or five versus five years of of prison. Yes, the example I wanted to put at, uh, give Thomas vis-a-vis -vis your uh, idea of understanding is the blue fin. It's a perhaps you can explain it better to me because it's um, aerodynamic dynamic. The blue fin reaches a speed swimming in the ocean, you know, giving circular movements and jumping that scientists could never understand how they did it because they don't have the physical capacity to jump to such a speed. And then by studying the aerodynamic properties of the jump, they realize that the blue fin is designing the environment around it to increase its ability to propel itself higher. So the blue fin, you cannot expect that we understand why it's doing it. It's just, it's a sensory motor ability acquired throughout the evolution of the species that they can do. And the same goes, let's say with a swimmer, that you are swimming and you are doing it better or playing soccer, Daniel, perhaps you can analyze all the skills that you have to develop to, to accomplish a particular task in football, but perhaps you just do it and it works and you keep doing it. 
I remember years ago, two of my American friends invited me to take a, to take a class in uh, a dance, a salsa class. And they were, before we get there, they were explaining to me. And then the man has to do this and the woman. And I'm like, no, 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 that's impossible. I have been dancing since I was three years old and, and I do it all the time. And my sister and I make everybody happy in a party because everybody has to dance when they are with us. But I have never understood the dancing in the same terms that I they are taught to people who never did it growing up. So um, it's basically practicing, practicing, practicing. So I'm going to conclude to say, saying that in Wisdom by Design, you incorporate more and more tools to hack your mind, to be able to go from where you are right now to where you would like to be. And you do it because you know that by practicing and by incorporating these tools, you are not, no, you don't do it um, because of, but you do it and it's possible because your mind is embodied and active, embedded and extended. Am I convinced you that tools are us? I'm pretty convinced. I am. <laughs> All right, me too. All right, thank you very much. And I'll see you for the next chapter which is about the artificial how is that humans instead of thinking that we are homo sapiens no we are homo faber f-a-b-e-r because we build build we design we design what do we design the artificial the tools that are help us go from a to b thank you see you in a week thank you thank you